Hello, my name is Mike Gaben and welcome to Making History Mission 5. This is the series in which I am trying to go through all of the missions in the Making History DLC for Kerbal Space Program and attempting for gold and then blaming it on the game when I don't achieve what I want. Today's mission, Mission 5, Blue Moon, you can see here actually I've only earned a silver. Uh, my high score is 7,700 points. You need 9,000 points for gold. And in this one, I actually do know exactly what it is that I've gotten wrong. My, my, my issue is I'm not entirely convinced I'm going to be able to do it. But I'll get to that in just a little bit. We might end up with silver here once again. But why don't we read the summary? Hello, team. It's Gene Kerman. Your next mission is purely research, along with a little bit of skill. You're heading back to the moon with a cargo of mystery goo. This time, the science team asked us to release the goo over a specific biome. And once you have done that, you'll have a chance to show off your piloting skills. Your budget and technology have increased for this mission, so build a spacecraft worthy of us Kerbals. And yes, this time it did say build. We get to build something. Um, We haven't done this since mission one. Mission one was the first mission that allowed us to build some things, and now we get to build some things again. This just says the same thing. And what we're going to be building is Muna 10. You can see the title is already up there, uh, an obvious rest. Uh, reference to Luna 10, the Russian probe from the 60s that was the first artificial satellite of the moon. Yes, the first human-built spacecraft that managed to achieve an orbit about the moon. But why don't we take a look at my Luna 10 that I built. Here it is right here. Um, there are some constraints placed on the vessel. Obviously, you require a mystery goo because that's part of the mission. The vessel also can't exceed 64 tons, and my current mass, you can see, is a little bit under that. Um, and in fact, this thing's actually quite large for what it is that it needs to accomplish, but part, there are some points for getting uh, there and having some fuel left over, so building big does kind of work to my advantage. You're also restricted in parts. Um, you can see, you know, you don't have the full parts here. They only give you some parts to work with. Uh, in particular here, if you take a look at the liquid fuel tanks, uh, there's only three of them and they're all in the 1.875 meter variety, so kind of forces you to build something that looks very much like this. Uh, one thing that did kind of annoy me that they didn't let me have if we look under structure no launch clamps really I'm gonna have to have this thing sitting on its engine bells on the pad oh well that's the way it is it'll work fine nonetheless let's take a look at some of the things that I've done I did do some tweaking let's look at the liquid fuel um, radio boosters here the thrust limiter is actually on the um, separation rockets and I turned that down and also took out half of the solid fuel for those rockets because I don't like the way when you separate they just kind of really just roar away I think they should peel off more slowly to me slow equals large and majestic well we'll see how it goes also have these vernier engines uh, and with these, what did I do? Oh, I turned down the gimbal limit actually quite severely. I found when it was running on just the sort of central stack, um, got some oscillating happening and that happens because the SAS is overcompensating. The gimbling is overcompensating. So it starts oscillating back and forth and a way of trying to mitigate that is to just turn down the gimbal limit. In fact, with these guys in the middle, I turned the gimbling right off. See, the gimbal is locked. So this thing... Um, the engines in the middle won't gimbal at all, but I have plenty of attitude control just with these verniers, so there's no worry there. Other than that, everything's pretty typical. I got my payload up here at the top. You know what? Why don't we talk about the payload when we pop the fairing in mission? I think it's time to get this ball rolling. Okay, to the moon for glory! Looks like you're ready to launch. Before transferring to lunar orbit, aim for a 100 kilometer orbit around Kerbin. You have 45 minutes, uh, 45 minute launch window. Don't miss it. We'll be in touch once you're high above the planet. Remember, your main goal is to land on the moon. Interesting. I'm supposed to remember that when you haven't yet mentioned that. 
<laughs> but don't worry, I did know because uh, I did get into the edit men menu in the build in the mission builder and took a look at what the actual requirements were. So I was fully aware that I am supposed to land on the moon. But how fuel efficient can you be? Okay, so as you can see, we are at the alternate launch site, the Woomerang launch site. And I've mentioned every time we're here, I really like this launch site. I like not having to launch from the equator or having the at least ability to launch from other places other than the equator. This one is at a latitude of 45 degrees, which means that our minimum inclination once we get into orbit about Kerbin will be 45 degrees. I cannot get into an inclination lower than that. And that adds a little bit of extra zest when you have to plan your transfer out to something like the moon. Now you might have noticed um, this 45 mention of a 45 minute launch window and you might be thinking 45 minutes just to get to a hundred kilometer orbit that seems awful generous well actually you do need that time let's take a look at what the situation is here and you'll see where I'm getting to so this is our launch site right here uh, once again we're gonna launch due east and that will put us in a 45 degree inclined orbit and our Two ascending and descending nodes are going to be, let's center on Kerbin, uh, 90 degrees from our launch site. So we'll end up with, let's try and put this at the 3 o'clock position, with our ascending node of our orbit here, and our descending node is going to be over here. And we're going to want to do our transfer to the moon at either the ascending or the descending node. Actually, it's going to be at the ascending node. And of course, we're going to perform our lunar in or moonar injection and start raising up our apoapsis and if i scroll out we'll raise up our apoapsis until it gets to about here but the thing to remember is <clears throat> excuse me is it takes about a day a little less than a day to get out to the moon and in a day the moon goes about a sixth of the way around in its orbit so as we make our way out to here the moon's going to rotate to probably around here and we're going to miss it and it turns out what you want to do is use up most of those 45 minutes to uh, try and get this a little bit better. So the mission clock has not started yet because I've yet to hit spacebar. So I'm going to put it on universal time. You see here uh, three minutes, three, three, what's that? Three hours and eight minutes, 308 time. <laughs> Let's see here. If we add 40 minutes... Um, that will get me to 48 minutes, but I've already talked for a few minutes already uh, And I do want to leave me some time to get up to the orbit comfortably because if I don't get to orbit in 45 minutes uh, The missions a fail. So why don't we put this at I'm gonna put it at 345 So I'm gonna do a quick save because I often screw up with time warping and get too aggressive with it But I'm gonna start time warping until this says 45 minutes. Whoa, see what I mean by too aggressive? One, two, three, four. Oh, a little bit past that, but it should be okay. And of course, during that time, Kerbin has rotated. So let's put the uh, launch site back at the three o'clock position. We'll be performing our lunar insertion burn here. Moonar insertion burn, come on, you can do it. And that will get our apoapsis to about here. And during that, on our journey out, the moon will be making about a sixth of a turn. This looks like a little less than a sixth of an orbit, but you know what? It's close enough. We need to get launched now. So SAS on, throttle up, let's push it. And we'll get set to make our gravity turn. I do like flying. I think everybody likes flying rockets that they built themselves because we all sort of have our own right we all sort of have our own style when it comes to building in so our own rockets have their own unique kind of feel and when you fly something that was built by somebody else it always sort of feels a little funny so it's, it's nice and comfortable now flying something that was built by me okay we'll just let this go is it good i think it's good at least for now so, the part that I failed last time was actually this part, this uh, inserting myself into a 100 kilometer uh, circular orbit about Kerbin. And the reason why I failed it was because uh, you need to get, well, I didn't fail it, I got my orbit, but in order to try and go for gold, 
there is a 90% accuracy that is required and that gets you in a thousand points uh, towards the 9,000 that you need for gold. And given the multipliers and stuff, whoops, there we go, <laughs> that come up later, uh, you need that thousand points if you're gonna get to gold. And I didn't get the 90%. So I'm gonna try and get the 90%, but I'm not entirely convinced I can. I still don't understand what 90% accuracy means. I've tried this a few times and have yet been able to achieve it. We'll give it a go. We'll see how it goes. Unfortunately, the game doesn't give you any kind of feedback as to whether you've got enough accuracy or not. The only time you know is when you get to the end and you read the mission summary. And I think we're high enough. Let's pop the fairing and take a look at what we got under here while the sun is still up. Ah, uh, here. We'll aim the camera. We'll take a look at this. I'm trying to make my rock. I'm, I'm such a minimalist when I build these things. I know I am. I never put on parts that aren't completely necessary. So I'm trying to put m more shapes in there, <laughs> trying to make it interesting. I did have limited parts, so I couldn't do a whole lot of different things. So for instance, one of the things I did is instead of one communitron, I got three communitrons, uh, just because I happen to have three-way symmetry kind of going with a lot of the other parts. So I thought I would go with that. This here is kind of like my instrument package. Um, and then I put it on this platform that comes when you use the interstage nodes with the fairing. I thought that like kind of like, and that gave me some space under here to work with. I can throw some more monoprop containers. I also threw three of these uh, Communitron 16S antennas, which serve absolutely zero purpose. I guess they're kind of like, you know, just greeblies. They're just there to sort of add some tiny little details. So trying to make things a little bit more interesting. All right, uh, let's start pushing this. And I want to keep an eye on my apoapsis. I want it to be really, really close to 100 kilometers. Because I know it needs to be ridiculously close for this to actually pay off. So I'm going to really take my time. I'm not in a rush. And fuel efficiency is not an issue. Okay, up higher, get that apoapsis down. still even the RCS is affecting things in little little bursts okay one last little push oh dear I might have not done a very good job You know what? I'm gonna cut it. The heck with it. You know what? It's it's it's. I know this isn't the uh, isn't uh, the ninety percent. This is worse than I've done in the past. But you know what? I don't care. Uh, <laughs> we'll just continue on. Parking orbit. Well done, team. Moon at ten reached a stable parking orbit. We're getting good at this. Next step is to transfer to the moon and establish a thirteen kilometer orbit. This will take pressure off the rest of it. So gold not in the cards and I wish it would give you some feedback here like here it says you achieved your orbit which is great but it tells you nothing about whether you achieved the accuracy there's nothing down here telling you that uh, it says here inclination accuracy is 90 degree 90 but that actually just tells you your inclination can be whatever you want it to be that's not really that useful of information okay let's uh, let's get out and get ready for our moon transfer so moon is a target this looks like it's set up pretty well okay so it is a now one thing to notice it's the burns about 849 meters per second but there is only 552 meters per second left in the stage so we are going to have to stage part way through the burn so that's why i'm going to keep it in this view for now so that i can be ready to stage when necessary all right, 2011-ish. The next stage actually has more. Let's go. There we go. The next stage actually has a higher thrust to weight ratio than this does because it's quite a bit smaller. Just going to get ready to stage here. Alrighty. Stage. And now that one is off. I can go now to map view. And get ready to cut throttle. Cut. Now just sort of. Going slowly. Oh, I think that's good enough. No reason. Like I said, 
We're going to do a mid-course correction. That's nice. Okay, now ultimately what I want is I want this periapsis at 13 kilometers because that's the altitude of this. And I would like my periapsis just touching this particular orbit. So let's see. Okay, that is certainly good enough for now. If we need to make any other um, adjustments, we'll do that once we are in the moon's sphere of influence. Now, this thing has no electricity generation um, other than when you're firing the engines and using the alternator in the engine. So you do have to use the hibernation mode that's built into the probe body. I have that on an action group. So if we take a look at our electricity drain, you can see it's draining just a little bit here, but if I hit zero, which is the action group I have it on, that goes down to zero. So we shall, now we're safe to do our time warping and get out towards that maneuver. All right, let's take a look. See, I think that is pretty fine. So we'll go with that. Now, there's again, uh, uh, an, uh, for a this time a 1.7 times multiplier if you can get a 90% um, accuracy for this orbit, including the inclination. Notice the orbit is inclined. But we're going to... Uh, this one's actually easier than I think doing it around Kerbin because there's no rush with this. So what I'm going to do, there's no time constraints on me right now, is I'm just going to give me some retrograde, get my capture, maybe a little less retrograde, leave that apoapsis out there a little bit. Um, and then we'll do our plane change out here. We'll get the, the plane, ex you know, as precisely as we possibly can. And then we'll come back and then we'll finish here. So we're going to do this in three burns. Let's actually start this. I don't want my periapsis to change too much. Let's get a little closer. There we go. And we can make further adjustments out there. So this is not... Okay, there we go. Let's get that time to... All right, we're going to be getting to our apoapsis in about an hour and a half. That's fine. I'm just going to ignore this. I don't care about that anymore. Let's go set up the next part of this. So our notice that the descending mode is right pretty much on periapsis, which means that our ascending node is going to be pretty much at apoapsis. And this particular maneuver is going to have a lot of a normal component. That's what it's mostly going to be. And what we're mostly interested in is, is cat getting our planes right. We're also looking at keeping our periapsis at 13 kilometers. Alrighty, that's looking pretty good to me. Um, and you do actually want to match this exact plane for this red orbit because there is an argument or what's the what's the longitude of the ascending node that you have to match but you will match that if you match this red orbit all right let's get ourselves out there now the main thing main thing i'm shooting for here is getting the inclination right and i know that the inclination is supposed to be 13.75 degrees so actually i'm going to do this burn and not really look at the maneuver node once again but look at inclination on Kerbal Engineer here and just gonna keep going until that says 13.75 degrees or as close as I can get to it. We can adjust our periapsis after this if it becomes necessary. Oh there we go 13.750 so we are definitely I'm gonna cut this one more burn okay I'm not using a maneuver node instead I'm watching my time to periapsis and when I'm close to it I'm just gonna start burning and bring down my apoapsis down to about 13 kilometers as well and with a smidge of luck hopefully this should all work out well let's start oh wait on wait 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 my in hibernation mode okay go go, go. <laughs> okay we're, we're good we're good we're good the closer I can stay to my periapsis in other words the closer that time to periapsis is zero oh here we go the less effect I have on my periapsis but I just passed it
Uh, I'm going to call it. Let's see. Uh, Gene seems happy. I'm not quite sure if that is uh, 90%, but I already know I'm not going to get gold, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. Uh, I might be a little bit off here with these two numbers. The inclination certainly is good, but let's see here. Moon or Lake. Team, we're nearly there. Just one last thing to do. The data we gather from this mission will help us send Kerbals next time. A monumental achievement. No pressure. You simply need to observe the mystery goo in low space over the east crater and then transmit the data back to Kerbin. Not sure exactly how this helps a lunar landing, but the science team assures us it is invaluable. Okay, so let's take a look at where we got. They gave us a waypoint. Here it is here. Now, you can see right now I need to do a major plane change if I'm going to uh, get there. I'm not going to do that major plane change. Instead, what I'm going to do is just time warp until it passes under my orbit. The thing is, with my altitude as low as it is, I can't time warp any faster than what you see right now. This is going to take forever with the way that the moon rotates so slowly. So we're not going to time warp from here. What I'm going to do, first of all, is make sure that my probe is in hibernation mode. There we go and uh, then we're going to go to the tracking station so i think you know what i think one more time around one more time around one more time yeah yes yeah, let's, let's 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 stop this here okay let's go back to muna 10 but once i'm within the the 15 kilometer radius the di the waypoint should disappear and then i should do my goose sample i think i'm gonna make it don't tell me I'm gonna to have to do a third pass. It might be, it's gonna be, oh, no, that's it. Okay, uh, Goo is on action group two. Transmit, transmit that data. And that is another 500 points for doing that one. The data is coming in and yes, we can confirm our hypothesis. Our calculations were correct. Nothing special whatsoever happened to the mystery goo while flying over the east crater. A complete absence of results was expected. Thank you for your hard work. Gene asked us to pass along one final instruction. Land moon at 10 in the far side crater. The more accurate you are, and the more of the probe that is intact, the more valuable the information will receive. And yes, this is the final bit of it. Uh, there is an accuracy bonus for our landing. Again, 90% accuracy, but it is much easier to get 90% accuracy with a landing than it is with uh, orbital insertions. And that gives us a two times multiplier. So we definitely want to do that. So let's take a look at where it is we need to land. Here it is. Uh, over at the far side crater and I obviously have to make a plane change and the correct place to make this plane change whoops <laughs> is going to be at about a quarter of an orbit ahead of that so about here-ish I think that looks about right we are definitely on our way might need to go a little more south let's see let's go with that all right and put that on the retrograde vector and get ready to make our landing. Now you might be looking at this thing and saying, oh my goodness, this thing's gonna be a beast to land. And in fact, you might even be looking at, oh, actually I have a lot of Delta V left, but you know what? I don't really care because this isn't my lander. This is my lander. I like landing little small things and I'm actually really happy with this little probe. It only weighs 610 kilograms and most, or not most of that, about a third of that I would say is in monopropellant. Monopropellant is going to be the fuel and you can see that our engines are these um, linear RCS thrusters, the one unidirectional ones. Um, and I'm going to use those for engines. Now, if we click on this, there is this hide actuation toggles. And so if you take a look at what I have done, I've disabled the yaw, the pitch, the roll and all that stuff, because I don't care about any of that. The reaction wheels in the probe body were more than adequate for attitude, attitude control. I have just changed, uh, toggled on four aft. Actually, all I care about is four. And I've also connected it so that, uh, four is with the throttle on the, um, 
you know, the, the on the nav ball. So I'll be able to throttle just like a normal engine. The only thing I have to do here is I have to enable these because I had these all disabled so that they wouldn't fire while we were doing any sort of attitude adjustments before this. Make sure they're all enabled. I do need all of those. Yep. And also I want to turn on these. I had these turned off in the VAB because I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to use any of this fuel. But now we are ready to go. Okay, I can see here I need to go a little bit towards this north. Just a little bit. A bit this way. Oh, I gotta put RCS on. There we go. Ah, nice engines. Don't forget to use. I mean, I'm a huge fan. Let's go back on the retrograde vector of monoprop as a propellant on small vehicles. It is actually a great propellant for small vehicles because it is so light. And um, because it is so light, you can get a lot of delta V. The This thing has a delta V of 1,178 meters per second because everything's so light. The engines are light, the propellant is light. Um, even though you don't get the best of ISPs, don't forget how much you can save just in weight. Here we go. Oh, I should cap lock. There we are. There we go. Don't slide away too far. Stop. Alright, RCS off. SAS off. Impressive. Most impressive. You have the markings of a great pilot. Take a breather. You deserve it. And there we go. Silver once again, 7,700 points. Exactly the same number of points I got. And now we can take a look here and see how we did. Uh, reaching orbit of Kerbin, I got 500 points. That's the one I was worried about. 90% um, accuracy would have gotten me 1,000 points there. And with all the multipliers, that's what makes the difference. 1.7 multiplier for my moon orbit, because that one was with 90% accuracy. Oh, 1,500 points for great fuel efficiency. That is because I had more than uh, 200 units of liquid fuel left over after I achieved my lunar orbit. I got my flyby over the east crater um, and that mystery goo that got me 500 points there. And then finally the times two multiplier for that brilliant, if not rather sloppy kind of landing. <laughs> Anyway, that is that. If you can get gold on this one, a tip of my hat to you, and uh, please let me know. But otherwise, I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.